So IHOP's in the news again. No, not that IHOP, this IHOP. This isn't the first scandal or even the first sexual scandal to come out of this charismatic apocalyptic cult masquerading as a church. And if I was a betting man, I'd say it won't be their last. I pulled my Instagram followers on what topics they wanted me to cover in this week's Morning Thoughts, and far and away, this topic led the pack. In Daryl Lucas' article for The Daily Costs on October 29th, he opens with, one of the most notorious outfits in the Christo-fascist universe may be on life support. The International House of Prayer in Kansas City, or IHOP KC, which has run praise and worship sessions 24 hours a day, seven days a week since 1999, was recently rocked by claims that its founder and longtime leader, Mike Bickle, had sexually assaulted a number of his adherents. So how did we get here? How did IHOP manage to dodge their other scandals and continue their so-called ministry? And will they dodge this one as well? And what does IHOP have to do with me? There's so much to talk about regarding this group that there's no way I'll be able to cover it all in a short video, but hopefully I'll be able to cover the highlights in a manner that demonstrates just how sinister this cult is. Hi, I'm Andy and my pronouns are they, them. Welcome to Morning Thoughts, an assigned Christian at birth podcast. This is a space where I educate my viewers on whatever topics linked to evangelical fundamentalism I've been studying each week. Sometimes I'll also make content about things that are going on in the world of fundamentalist Christianity, and that's what we're doing today. We're going to explore one of the mainstays of the new apostolic reformation a denomination that, according to Daryl Lucas, is an overtly fascist offshoot of the religious right that seeks to bring about the second coming by taking over the world. This episode is going to contain a lot of triggering topics like sexual assault, pastoral abuse, homophobia, charismatic theology, suicide, and more. Please take care of yourself and feel free to bow out of this one if it's too much for you right now. For more information on the new apostolic reformation specifically, go ahead and check out the show from Friday to get caught up. I'm not gonna lie, it was almost too much even for me while I was writing this. Watching through the footage made me feel like I had ice in my veins because my traumatized gaslit brain has been trying for years to convince me I've just been making up the story for attention and having my memories validated and even having repressed details brought forth has been a total trip. For everyone who's still here with me, brace yourselves for another deep dive into the archives of my religious trauma. Let's get into it. Before the International House of Prayer came into being in 1999, Mike Bickle was already well known for his prophetic and eschatological views. A founding member of the Kansas City Prophets at the Church Kansas City Fellowship, Bickle claimed to have visions. And before I tell you about these visions, please remember that Bickle and co. have no problem with prophecies and visions not coming true, because they say even with a bunch of false prophecies, there are prophecies that come true, and it's worth weeding through the false ones to get to the real ones. Yeah, okay. This story comes from a website called deceptioninthechurch.com. During these years, Bickle claimed an angel revealed that God would appear to him in the form of another person named Dawn in a vision or a dream. Bickle said the vision eventually took place, and part of its message was to show him that Jesus appears in thousands of different faces to portray something, Bickle said. He was trying to say, I am your friend, I am your familiar friend, and I'm going to show you all the things so that you can move in the power of the Spirit. Later, Bickle related that during his trip to heaven, Jesus commissioned him to be one of God's new generals to lead his end-time army. Although Bickle claims he met with the Lord face to face, it was an out-of-body experience. It was 2.16 a.m., he said, and in a flash he was there, but it wasn't the cave where he had earlier related he had been. Instead, he was standing in a 20 by 30 foot room that had clouds on the bottom, on the top, and the walls. It was the courtroom of God. God was in the room, Bickle said, but rather than appearing as a being of light, he was a presence that Bickle wouldn't look at. God rebuked him for not being patient enough in choosing leaders for his movement. Later, the being ordered Bickle to ride in a golden chariot, one of about 35 in a procession of leaders, apostles, and prophets who would be joining the movement that would someday be worldwide. Bickle said during the trip, God did not commission him as an apostle, but he said he understood the experience to mean that if he was faithful, he would have an opportunity in the grace of God to fill an apostolic calling. Whoa, that was a lot. But I wanted you to hear all of it so that you have a better understanding of the 
actual insane beliefs held by the man who would go on to start IHOP KC. But even before IHOP, there were whispers of false prophecy and manipulation. According to the IHOP wiki, in early 1990, nine years prior to the start of IHOP KC, Mike Bickle and the Kansas City Fellowship were highly criticized by Pastor Ernie Gruen in sermons and a well-circulated 130-page document titled Documentation of the Aberrant Practices and Teachings of Kansas City Fellowship. In the sermons and document, Gruen criticized Bickle's teachings on eschatology and documented a alleged cases of manipulative uses of prophecy at the Kansas City Fellowship. IHOP was founded in Kansas City, Missouri by Bickle in 1999. The International House of Pancakes sued them in 2014, so now their official name is IHOP KC. They're known for their 24-hour prayer rooms. People can come and go at any times, and their employees run shifts. The way it was explained is that they have 25 full worship teams with a 24-hour occupation. That means any time of day or night someone wants to go there and pray and worship, they can do so. However, the people who are leading it, the people up on stage doing the worship music, and the volunteers who pray with people, they raise their own support in order to be there. They aren't paid. And the foot steps of other organizations such as Youth with a Mission and Campus Crusade, these volunteers raise their own money monthly to sustain their lifestyles in order to be there. Bickle also created IHOP University, which is a seven-month program to become a missionary. I don't know what you can learn in seven months. I mean, there's no training in native languages or anything like that. It just seems I mean, the whole thing seems shady to me, but this is extra shady. Bickle is a self-educated pastor. I mean, I was going to say red flag number one, but this whole episode has already been a ton of red flags. He's a self-educated pastor with prophetic visions from God. He speaks a lot about ushering in the end times with the help of his prayer team. The way he describes it is preparing the way for the second coming of Jesus. It's definitely an end times focused apocalyptic movement with a judgmental and wrathful view of God. He's actually been known to say that divine genocide is something people should be thankful for. That really hits home for me when thinking about the current current happenings in the Middle East. And it just reaffirms what I've said about how many, many, many Christians and definitely evangelicals consider the deaths to be collateral damage in bringing about the end times. Bickle is a leader in the National Apostolic Reformation Movement. He's committed to Dominion Theology and the Seven Mountain Mandate that evangelical Christians should be in charge of all seven pillars of society. Again, for more info on that, check out the episode I put out last Friday. So there's so many things, there's so many traps here. First of all, it was founded in 1999 by a guy named Mike Bickle. He's this very charismatic Christian leader. He was a pastor, and he claims to have had a series of angelic visitations and visions and a divine message to start this movement. And this is something that cult leaders usually claim, is having this special divine revelation. And I'm not saying that that can't even happen. I'm not saying that people don't have these special experiences, uh, but it's, it's one of the things, one of the markers uh, for people claiming to have this divine supernatural authority, and then people believe what they say, their their doctrine based on that. Now, Mike Bickle often tells his people to question everything that he says. He says, don't believe me, search the Bible. But if you look at the actual movement of IHOP, there's no theological diversity. There's no diversity of belief. Everyone believes the exact same thing. And not only that, they have this accent, this IHOP accent. They they speak words in the same way. It's it's almost eerie. You can tell there's this cult kind of vibe. So there's a difference between saying you should think critically and then not exposing anyone to different beliefs and to not actually having people study them, not encouraging that in your school and not endorsing or accepting any leaders who have different theologies and ideologies. Other things I've learned about this cult, aside from forcing them to raise their own money to be there, is that there's often a heavy sedative feeling in the prayer room, and leaders have actually encouraged college-age students and even other adults to avoid contact with skeptical parents and family members. 
isolating people from their family members, another mark of a cult. Before I jump into why this story is so personal for me, let's check in with cultdatabase.com and see what they have to say about IHOP KC. The site records accusations of cult-like behavior, leadership issues and scandals, theological controversies, controversies over music and worship practices, and political controversies. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read all these out loud, but I encourage you to read what they have to say for yourself. Aside from Mike Bickle, there were several other senior leaders there in those beginning days, but for the sake of keeping this video as condensed as possible, I'm only going to focus on two. The first one will be real quick. This man's name was Bob Jones, not the same Bob Jones as the Bob Jones University Bob Jones. This Bob Jones was exposed when two women came forward in 1991 and told church leaders that Jones had used his prophetic authority to touch and fondle them sexually. Jones admitted it and was removed from ministry. The other man I want to talk about is Lou Engel, someone who's interdenominational parachurch organization I came in contact with in September of the year 2000. Lou Engel, a senior leader at IHOP KC, is best known for founding The Call, and he's also featured in the documentary Jesus Camp. The wiki page for The Call actually sums things up pretty decently when it says, originally planned as a co-ed youth version of Promise Keepers, The Call hosts 12-hour or 24-hour events which combine prayer, sermons, and Christian rock worship and gospel music. So it's basically a replica of what's going on at the House of Prayer, but for day-long events. These events are also known for their cultural and ethnic diversity, described in National Review as the breakfast club of religious gatherings. Speakers at the call events frequently draw parallels between the pro-life movement and the civil rights movement. The call is meant to be a gathering of fasting and prayer to confess personal and national sins, to pray for God's blessing on the nation, and for the spiritual awakening among youth. Personal and national repentance among Christians and prayer for spiritual awakening has been the core focus of the call since its inception. Much of the events are devoted to prayer and sermons against abortion and homosexuality. The call events have been attended by prominent evangelical leaders such as Mike Huckabee, James Dobson, and Tony Perkins. Engel believes that the gatherings such as the call are necessary in order to prevent divine judgment from taking place in the United States due to legalized abortion and the acceptance of homosexuality in American culture. So when I was 15 in the year 2000, which makes me sound very, very old, (laughs) and I am, (laughs) I was made to attend an extracurricular event at our church on Thursday nights. I believe it was called the School of Prayer. My mom insisted that I go. I was the only teen in this group. It was mostly adults from their like 40s to 60s. I absolutely didn't want to be there. I was bored and I was honestly pretty resentful of my mom for making me go. This is the place where some of you have heard me talk about how when I was in high school, I was encouraged to take shifts in the prayer closet to help pray George Bush Jr. into office. This is where that took place. My best friend Trace likes to tell me that it's my fault that George W. Bush made it into the presidency because of my time in the prayer closet. So I apologize to everyone in advance who's been watching this. It's all my fault. So within this group, the School of Prayer, this group of elderly folks, I shouldn't say elderly, I'm almost 40. (laughs) This group of adults at church when I was a teenager heard about this thing called the call. It basically seemed like church camp to me, like worship and sermons and things like that. I was not dying to go to this by any means, but this group of people took up a collection to send three of us from the youth group as representatives from our church to this event, the call that was going to be in Washington, D.C. on September 2nd. Remember, this is the year 2000. So I was picked to go because I was in the group. And then there was a dad in the group whose daughter was in youth group with me. And so it was me and her and her boyfriend. And we were put on a red eye flight on a Thursday night with a transfer at like 3 a.m. in St. Louis. Mind you, I'm 15 years old with two other teenagers. We transfer, we land in D.C. at like five in the morning, get picked up by the mom of a youth who is tied to the International House of Prayer. (sighs) Sorry, this story is a lot. (laughs) Um, This is the first time in my life that I ever felt truly unsafe 
this woman, when she picked us up, loaded us into her minivan, got on the freeway. I'm sitting in the first row of seats, so like right behind the driver. And I realize the car is going really fast, like faster than any car I've ever been in. So I kind of leaned over to see and she was driving like 95 on the freeway. And it was in that moment that I was like, oh my gosh, I am completely out of control of this situation and I could die. She ended up getting pulled over by a cop and then just went right back onto the freeway and started speeding again. So I was stressed to say the least. We got to their house, dropped off our bags. And so this was early Friday morning now. And then there was this other group of kids who had already arrived at the house and it was boys and girls. And they had a massive basement downstairs and all the girls had to stay on one side and all the boys had to stay on the other, but it was still the same room. So that was interesting to me because I know that if my mom knew that she would not be down. So we were the last to get there. We really only had time to put our bags down. And then there was a mandatory day of sightseeing in DC. And I always said like I've never been to DC, but I I have been to DC because I was there for this, but it wasn't your typical DC trip. However, they tried to make it a typical DC trip. So that day they forced us into this like day of sightseeing in DC. And it started out with a trip to the Holocaust Museum. I had not been expecting that. That was very heavy, obviously. I was in a situation where I was already out of control taking public transit, which I had never been allowed to do before in my life. And then we were taken to walk around some of the monuments. I don't have a good idea of what we saw, except I do remember seeing the Lincoln Memorial. And then like a couple other like World War II memorials or something. I don't know. So we're taken back to the house later that night. And then of course, because we're teenagers without any supervision down in the basement, everybody stayed up really late and I just wanted to go to sleep, but I couldn't. So that was Friday. The next morning we had to wake up at 5 a.m., to get ready to go to this thing. So I'm extra sleep deprived from the flight the day before. And the times I've told this story to people in my life, I have always known two things. One, I was starving out of my mind that day. And two, I had formulated this plan where if I was hungry, I was going to sneak away to buy a Wetzel pretzel. And the reason I formulated this plan is because I had been told this event was at the National Mall, not having any type of reference for anything in D.C. I assumed the National Mall was like the Mall of America or something like a really big mall. I knew I had this plan where I could go sneak away and eat a pretzel. But I, my whole adult life, I couldn't figure out why I needed to sneak away, like why that was an integral part of the plan. Turns out, while I was doing research for this video, I found out that this was also a fasting event. So we were run ragged for two days and then woken up at 5 a.m. and sent to an event that was outside from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. with no food. I don't even have words. If I had a child, I cannot imagine sending them into that environment. Again, this is year 2000, no cell phone. And I know the mom did not come with us to that. So it was just a bunch of us teenagers. I believe they estimated that like 400,000 people were there. Like, I don't even want to speculate on what could have happened to me. I'm really glad. I mean, it was... I don't know, I'm not trying to compare trauma, but compared to what could have happened, I would say minimal trauma. However, my trauma from this day is kind of a lot. It had been raining the day before, so I remember it was very muddy. We were just standing in muddy grass and it's a ton of charismatic speakers, a ton of charismatic worship. And charismatic worship is different than typical worship. Like, to be fair, there were plenty of worship songs and performances by Christian artists and groups, but when they really wanted the prayer and the intercessory stuff to be happening. The music is just like the same chords over and over again, and it just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and builds, and there's never any resolution. And so I've talked before how I have learned that certain musical chords and the way that they are used can be manipulative to like the brain waves and things like that. So sleep deprived, starving, manipulative brainwashing tactics. I don't remember too much of that day specifically. I do remember being in that crowd. I remember the hands raised. I remember being starving. I remember being exhausted. I remember not wanting to be there. I remember thinking, I can't do this. But everyone else seemed dialed in to me. So I did my best, but I remember at some point in the afternoon, I just could not go on anymore. And I found a plastic bag on the ground. And so I spread it out and then put my backpack behind it. And I passed out, just like curled up on this plastic bag and my backpack completely fell asleep. I felt guilty, 
but I could not stay conscious for one more second. When I woke up, there was a speaker. I always kind of thought it was Benny Hinn because I know he was there and his stuff really worked me over a lot too. I'm not sure if the one I woke up to was Benny Hinn, but what I woke up to was a charismatic speaker on stage. Everyone's praying and he's saying, when you open your eyes, you're going to see the flaming tongues of the Holy Spirit on everybody's heads. And in that moment, I knew I wasn't going to see anything. But because of where I came from and the situation I was in, I assumed it was because I was a bad Christian, not because the whole thing was bunk. There were high stakes emotions running through that crowd all day long. We were there from 10 to 10 and then had to take public transit back to that house. I assume we ate dinner after that late at night. I don't really remember. But the very next morning, early again, we were back on the plane back home on Sunday. So I had never felt a lot of the feelings and emotions that I felt on that trip. I guess in the beginning, I probably felt like, oh, I'm so mature and I'm chosen and I don't really want to go, but it's good that the adults in the church are picking me. But like after that, I was just, I was rocked. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) I think that's all I'm probably going to say about that for today because my chest is starting to like get heavy. But now that I'm kind of done sharing what my experience was with that trip, we're going to show some clips from actually Lou Engel himself has footage from this day posted on his YouTube. So I'm going to show you just how intense the day was. Roll the film. John the Baptist, Lord, crying in the desert, Lord, burning in the desert for you, on fire for you, Lord. They have no toleration in their heart for Jezebel, Lord. We would be a double portion generation of Nazarites, Lord, and we would cry out to you for revival in our land, Lord. Right now, if you are absolutely serious about enlisting in the army, if you are absolutely serious about giving your life for a Jesus revolution, if you're absolutely serious about putting your life on the line, whatever the cost, whatever the consequence, if you say, God, I'm serious, use me. I want you to stand to your feet right now. Raise your hands if you mean it. Begin to lift your voices. Cry out. Cry out. Today as we move into this segment, we ask for something supernatural, not only here, but to break out all over this nation. Of a turning of two generations, we ask. In Daryl Lucas's Daily Koss article, he writes, Most religious right watchers like yours truly know IHOP KC as one of the fountainheads of the New Apostolic Reformation, an overtly fascist offshoot of the religious right that seeks to bring about the second coming by taking over the world. Back in 2011, IHOP KC got a lot of mainstream heat when several of its missionaries were featured in the documentary God Loves Uganda, which explored the ties between American fundies and the homophobic tide in Uganda. In response, IHOP KC claimed it wasn't political. That claim is downright laughable considering that several members of IHOP Casey's board sit on the board of The Call, the ministry of Lou Engel of Jesus Camp fame. Additionally, Bickle emceed The Response, which was a prayer rally associated with The Call that launched Rick Perry's 2012 presidential bid. In an article by the Christian Broadcasting Network, they say, The Call is not an event. The Call is a movement emphasizing prayer, worship, and fasting for spiritual breakthrough. It is a nameless and faceless movement joining the generations. The primary participants are young people. The musicians on stage are worshipers, not entertainers. The Call is a grassroots movement. It is a cross-cultural and cross-denominational gathering. There's so much more I could say about the call and Lou Engel, but for the sake of time in this video, we have to move on. Let's speed forward 12 years, so from 2000 to 2012. During that time, there were many more different call events, but they were at different cities all over the country. I never went to another one, but they were just as big, just as wild, just as brainwashing, and probably, definitely not probably, just as traumatic for many other kids who were in attendance 
at those. Both the call and IHOP KC grew in participants and popularity over those years. And this led to many vulnerable high school and college students to become indoctrinated into the belief system of Lou Engel and the other charismatic leaders at the call and people who also worked for IHOP KC. What we didn't know at the time was that this movement was coalescing into something that would come to be known as the New Apostolic Reformation. This next story shows just how dangerous these interdenominational parachurch organizations can be due to the lack of oversight, lack of accountability, and the encouragement of the belief that anyone can become an apostle or a prophet. Bethany Deaton was dedicated to family and faith, but those who loved her say what started as a religious devotion among friends became a dangerous cult. The newlywed was found dead near her Kansas City home. Correspondent Troy Roberts investigates for tomorrow night's 48 Hours. Bethany Deaton came from a Christian home in Arlington, Texas. She met Tyler, her eventual husband, at Southwestern University, where he seemed to be pursuing God. They were just friends for a very long time as Tyler established himself as the leader of their small friend group. He had been struggling with sexual addiction toward men and wanted to change. He believed it was a choice that could be cured and Bethany wanted to help heal him. They stayed close friends, and in December 2007, Tyler went up to the Kansas City National Convention promoted by IHOP. Upon graduation, he moved several members of their group to Kansas City in order to study at IHOP. Tyler called them the community and had men living in one house with women in another. Tyler called himself an apostle, which made sense at the time to other group members, considering IHOP's whole thing is that apostles and prophets have been resurging since 2001. Tyler controlled their eating, what they wore, and even their relationship. Finally, he claimed he'd cured his own homosexuality and finally wanted to start dating Bethany, which is what she had been hoping for all along. However, the people who knew them said it was more like a sibling relationship with no real physical affection. Once Once they got married, she wanted to start a family right away, but was left begging for affection from Tyler. It's reported that he couldn't bring himself to have sex with her, and she took it personally. After they married, Tyler moved her from the women's house to the basement of the men's house to live with him, even though he didn't often stay there. On October 29th, 2012, the day before Bethany died, Tyler was allegedly fed up with her behavior and led a prayer circle where he demanded community members put the community above their own personal selfish desire. Tyler didn't respond to the news of Bethany's death the way detectives thought that a grieving newlywed would. Bethany's family was shocked and the medical examiner ruled the death a suicide. Before this service, though, Bethany's mother got a call from investigators that someone had confessed to her murder. They then needed to send her body back to Kansas for the investigation. Why? Mika Moore, another member of the community and another person who was studying with IHOP KC, was taken to the police by two other their eye hoppers, where Mika told the police that he had killed Bethany. He was then charged with first degree murder, and a second autopsy was performed, eventually changing the cause of death from suicide to unsure. The body had already been embalmed, so there wasn't much they could really do in that second autopsy. Mika said he held the plastic bag over her head until she died. Mika said he killed Bethany because Tyler told him to. He said they'd been drugging Bethany for months with Seroquel and sexually abusing her. They were scared she was going to tell her therapist, and Tyler told Mika to kill Bethany before that could happen. Tyler, of course, denied he was running a cult. It later came out, though, that he was having sex with male members of the group, including Mika, and what he said were religious experiences. Gross. Four men said Tyler used his authority to start sexual relationships with men in the group. IHOP immediately stopped associating with Tyler and the community, not wanting to have any relation to something that people were calling a cult. There was no evidence of any drugs in Bethany's system or evidence of Mika being in the car and being the one to put the plastic bag around her head that was there when she was found. All there was was the confession that Mika soon recanted. His lawyer said he was innocent and that his confession was a nonsensical fictional account. They said he made it as a result of an exorcism performed by IHOP that put him in a mentally fragile state. Tyler backed this up by saying the confession was spurred on by control from IHOP, who had sold Mika out to the police in order to save their own reputation. In January of 2013, Mika entered a not guilty plea, and there was no substantiation of his confession, so the murder charge was dropped in October of that year. 
Many believe Bethany did take her own life because Tyler isolated and shunned her to the point that she believed she had no other option. Mika said that IHOP are not prophets, but manipulators. And Bethany's mom does not believe that her daughter killed herself. There's no conclusive evidence to this story either way. What I can say is that this story clearly shows just how much has gone on within this organization. The reason I went into detail about this story is to show you just what kind of crazy that IHOP's leadership and beliefs both fostered and encouraged. Did Mika really kill her for Tyler or did Bethany take her own life? Either way, the story is heartbreakingly tragic and will forever be a huge stain on IHOP Casey's reputation, no matter how much they've tried to distance themselves from it. So why are we talking about Mike Bickle, Lou Engle, and IHOP KC today? According to the Kansas City Star just a few days ago on October 29th, IHOP KC issued a statement saying that a few days prior that they had made the leadership team of IHOP KC aware of serious allegations spanning several decades concerning its founder, Mike Bickle. They also added, they found these allegations of clergy sexual abuse by Mike Bickle to be credible and long-standing. The article goes on to say, the men say that they believed Bickle's actions were not above reproach and fall short of biblical standards for leaders in the church. To be clear, the allegations made about Mike Bickle's misconduct were sexual in nature where the marriage covenant was not honored, the statement said. Furthermore, the allegations made also reveal that Mike Bickle used his position of spiritual authority over the victims in order to manipulate them. It's really annoying to me how this statement that came out from IHOP is just so freaking evangelical. The biggest, the thing they highlight first, you know, is that Mike Bickle's marriage covenant wasn't honored. That's above the fact that he used his position of spiritual authority over victims to sexually manipulate them. It's the marriage covenant that wasn't honored. That's the bigger problem. Like, ugh. I can't. Last weekend, it was reported that the focus of Bickle's sermon was on false accusations, but since then, he's agreed to step down while the investigation takes place, an investigation that will be done by an organization led by the son of Billy Graham. The Kansas Star further reports that Stuart Greaves told followers on Sunday that the leadership team had asked Bickle to not preach or teach from the IHOP KC platform, attend the 24-hour prayer room, or engage in his social media channels while we work with others to assess the situation. Bickle, aged 68, has not responded publicly to the allegations. IHOP KC leaders have not said whether they have reported the allegations to the police. Um, I can bet I know the answer. At Sunday's service, they urge those who experience traumatic events that are of this nature to seek out an IHOP KC leader or counselor. Interesting that IHOP KC is directing victims to seek out counseling within the organization itself. Sounds awfully a lot like another cult I know. Scientology. But wait, while investigating the story, I found out that the Bob Jones sex scandal of the 90s and Bickle's downfall today are not the only pastoral sexual abuse scandals linked to IHOP KC. For this bit of news, I'll be highlighting a few important paragraphs from an article for the Kansas City Star in which Judy L. Thomas writes, In 2018, IHOP KC was in the news again when a Washington woman went public with her story, alleging that Brad Tebbett, a missionary at IHOP KC, sexually abused her for two and a half years when she she was a teen, and he was a youth pastor at a Baptist church in Modesto, California. For years, IHOP KC has come under criticism by ex-staffers and former followers who accuse it of being cult-like. The article then mentions that this is not the first sexual abuse scandal within IHOP KC. In 2018, a staff member who led an internship program for those 50 and older was accused of sexually abusing a woman at a church in California in the mid-1980s when the accuser was a teen. Jennifer Graves Roach of Seattle said she had reported the abuse to church leaders in California in 1988, but they told her to forgive and forget and never talk about it again. Of course they did. She later learned that Tebbett had moved to Kansas City and was leading the Simeon Company internship at the International House of Prayer. In May 2018, Roach filed a lawsuit against Tebbett, First Baptist Church in Modesto, and its successor, Cross Point Community Church. She later dropped Tebbett from the suit when he agreed to cooperate with the case. Cross Point settled with Roach in 2019 for $267,000. $1,500. IHOP KC issued a news release in April 2019 saying all investigations of Tebbit had been completed. In June 2022, Tebbit was listed as an alleged sexual abuser in a document released by Southern Baptist officials. When the star asked if Tebbit was still on staff at IHOP KC, it responded in an email referring to Tebbit as one of our missionaries and referring the star to its April 2019 news release. 
That was a lot, I know. <laughs> if you're here with me, I'm glad you took the time to learn about the insidious nature of IHOP KC and their various other interdenominational parachurch organizations like the call. I hope you see now just how damaging the movement of the New Apostolic Reformation has been and continues to be. When paired with my video from Friday, you can see how alarming it is that the person who is now second in line to the presidency, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, holds these beliefs, runs in these circles, and says that he loves the teachings of these leaders. Usually this is the part of the podcast where I talk about the books I've read lately and give out some recommendations, but honestly, I'm exhausted and you might be too. I'm just going to call it for now. I will be sure and add my recent recommendations to next week's episode of Morning Thoughts, so be sure and come back next next Sunday at 12 p.m. Pacific for that. If you'd like to support me, please give this channel a follow and share it with your friends. If you'd like to support me financially, I do take one-time donations and also monthly recurring donations for perks at my Buy Me A Coffee, which you can find at buymeacoffee.com slash assigned X-T-I-A-N. <sighs> Thank you for being here with me. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for seeing me. The times, the few times I've tried to tell this story to people in my immediate family, it has not been well received. So again, just thank you for letting me talk and thank you for hearing me and believing me. All right. Have a great week. Okay. Bye.